Tony Montana was the first example of someone from a Cuban that went out and got what he wanted in life, you know? Hi, Nelson. Welcome back to the podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. Hey, Rosie. Hey, Jeremy. Good to see you again, of course. Yeah, I'm excited. Welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We had you on a show um, in, I think it was September 2021. So a little mm. bit more than six months ago. And the main reason you're back is because a few weeks ago, you published your first book. Congratulations. I did. Thank you. That's amazing. Appreciate it. And I don't even remember, I quickly squeezed through the episode. I don't remember you mentioned anything about the book last time during the episode. No. Actually. I, 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 it's so. funny. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I decided I actually, did, I, I've always wanted to write a book and I had an idea of several books I want to write this mm. book specifically. I was approached by the, another friend of ours from gratitude who was an ML 46. Uh, he was in the group right after us that graduated after us mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he opened a publishing company, like a little small one. And we became friends and he was, he really liked what I had to say every time we talked and he felt like I, I had enough life experience or whatnot to write a book. And I, it's something I always wanted to do. This has been a life goal. So it's definitely checking off the bucket list for sure. And, um, <laughs> the podcast is, you know, first hundred copies just came in yesterday. So I'm excited. Cool definitely. That? Uh, working on small, you know, podcast tour. I'm doing a, a big book launch event in the next coming weeks in Miami. So I'm excited. Wow. Very excited. Exciting times. Yeah. So the book is called Montana Method. Uh, Rosie, why Montana? Does that yep. ring a bell for you? Oh, God, don't do that. <laughs> My memory's awful. No, I don't know. I don't, I don't think she's seen the movie, but for the people who know, the it, the tagline is it, the Scarface Strategy for Success. Okay. So yes. It's Scarface yes, yes. related. So, I don't think I've ever seen Scarface. I know you two might fall out with me about this. I don't think I've ever <laughs> seen it though. So this 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 is a just a, a copy of, of the movie poster. It's basically he's this is how Scarface is standing. It's the same black and white, same red letters, everything yeah. is pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Um You're replacing so, Tony Montana. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> definitely not. <laughs> uh you know, I'm definitely not going to deal drugs and I'm definitely not going to get shot. So, but, um, <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, I just ruined the movie for, for Rosie, didn't I? <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. I don't have to watch anyway, it now, at least. Um, no, you should watch it. It's a, it's a very, very intriguing movie. Um, so the reason I called it the Montana method is because for a long time when I was a kid, I had no real examples in my community of success. No real examples mm -hmm. of anyone who really accomplished anything that they dreamed of or that they strive for. I, I grew up in a pretty low middle income, higher low income, you know, threshold of Miami. Mm -hmm. And my mother was a waitress. My dad was a truck driver, very blue collar. And I, at the time, Miami, my family still was kind of living in like the little Havana area. Miami is very poor which now all mm. the cubans live in hialeah for anyone who knows miami <laughs> a little Havana. there's no cubans left there anymore but anyway um no. <laughs> and i'll i'll just tell you a, a short synopsis it's it's actually the the preface of the book i tell you a story of why i'm writing a book called the montana method so when i, I was about 11 years old it was about a week before my my 12th birthday and mm -hmm. I was alone in the house with my parents and my sister, she, she typically was always like with cousins or aunts. She was that sibling who was always like out and about, never home. And mm -hmm. that night I was home with my dad and my mom, he couldn't get a hold of my mom for whatever reason. At that point, my parents' marriage was destroyed. They were, they were going to get divorced at, at any moment. It was, it was pretty bad. And right. the, that night my mom got home and I was just in my room kind of doing my thing. And I could, I, I didn't want to walk outside because I could just hear it. It was like these screeches and I could hear glass breaking and I can hear doors slamming. And I was like, eh, I don't, I don't want to watch this, you know? And mm -hmm. then my mother yells for me to go outside 
and I kind of wait a second and I hear my cousin burst through the door and separate him. I thank God my cousin was there because if he wasn't, I, I, I really think one of my parents would be dead today, honestly. Um, wow. And funny enough, side story about my cousin that I'll tell you later. He actually burglarized my house 10 years later. So <laughs> he broke into my house 10 years later and stole um, all my stuff. But anyway, um, wow. so I walk out and they immediately like it's like a total change. Everybody's quiet. No one's doing anything. And then my dad mm. leaves the house and he kind of guilts me into going with him. To this day, I regret going with my dad. I felt really bad. I felt like I abandoned my mother. And But I just did it really just to kind of like separate them and, and get one of them out of the house. So I left with my dad. Mm. And that yeah. th that car ride felt eternal, man. It was only 20 minutes. We went from my house to my grandma's house, but it, it felt like it, it was forever. And then we finally get there. And my mom shows up like five minutes after us to pick to like you know, pick me up and I'll never forget it. She pulls up in this 1988 Cadillac Fleetwood champagne color. It had these chrome, <laughs> chrome handles. It had wood grain in the, it was like the car back in my old neighborhood. It was like the car to have. It was a very, yeah. you know, it was a very my, local subculture Miami thing. And she, it was my cousin, Lewis, uh, Lewis hung mm. who was driving the car. He pulls up with my mom. I take off with them. And then for the next few months, he got into some trouble, and he's actually my mom's godson. So he got okay. into some trouble, and my mom, to kind of, like, keep him in line, decided to move in with him, and we started living with him and his family for the next few months. And um, I, I grew up with him, and his he has a bunch of siblings and half-siblings. His father was, like, Abraham. <laughs> he had a bunch of kids. But um, I, I grew up with... A, a close four of his siblings and they were really like older siblings they weren't really like cousins to me and we're not even related mm -hmm. by blood but we just all grew up together and you know so there was um there was damien who was the oldest and that was lewis's half brother he was like really quiet and and just i, I thought he was creepy so i never i never bothered him <laughs> and then there was adrian who was the next oldest one that lived in the house adrian was and lewis are very similar because lewis and adrian were like wild and get they were get in trouble in the street all the time and they were like you know little juvenile criminals uh adrian yeah. luckily he decided to join enlist in the in the marines and he turned his life around and um that went well for him right before the iraq war you know that was nuts anyway lewis was the next one and then mm -hmm. there was the youngest one was jesenia which is my other cousin and she was like the young responsible sibling trying to keep it all together she did what she could <laughs> so anyway after a few months of living there it was a lot of fun because his friends would come over. They'd play video games with me, and I'd, I'd beat them all, and it was it was fun. <clears throat> but my mother kind of realized that that we lived on he, he lived on Forty Seventh Avenue and Flagler Street here in Miami. That the neighborhood's called Kinlock. He realized that neighborhood wasn't conducive to him like improving his behavior. It was actually mm -hmm. <laughs> like the opposite. <laughs> so she decided to move us back to our house in up in Miami Gardens in Carroll City, and. When we moved to our house, it was a little different because now I'm in my house, right? And then it was um, it was a cool bonding experience with me and Lewis. He kind of was actually, I mean, in a in a good way, he was a, a male figure in my life when I re really didn't mm -hmm. have one. And you know, we 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 bonded over the few months that he lived with me, and uh, he he would religiously put Scarface on on uh, in the DVD player every day. We'd watch it every day. Every day, sometimes <laughs> twice a day, sometimes three times a day. And um, wow. we even had like a parrot. Well, I named the parrot Yayo because, uh, you know, he, his his favorite line was, Chi Chi, get the Yayo. <laughs> so I named him Yayo. <laughs> and then Bird knew like every line in the movie. So it just, I learned the movie. And Tony Montana was the first example of like someone from a Cuban that, that went out and, and got what he wanted in life, you know? I mean, he uh, yeah. granted, he was a drug lord and he killed people and he did bad things. But there's a lot of good qualities that in him that I that I saw. And at the time, I didn't really understand it. This movie, for to me, mm. was like watching like a superhero or something. Like, I was like, who is this guy, you know? But later yeah. on in my life, I realized that I used a lot of the, the things I saw in the movie in my life and I wasn't realizing it. Because this was my first example of, of someone who succeeded or at least got something that they wanted. So, mm -hmm. you know, and then out born is the Montana method, my Kung Fu, my <laughs> fighting style I for see. life. I write in the intro that 
Um, when life gives you a beating, the answer is not to just take the beating and do nothing. The answer is to learn from 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 that encounter and then learn from the next one and learn from the next one until you develop a fighting style. And then you're not just a victim anymore. Now you're you're equipped with the what you need to encounter life, hit it head on and get what you want out of it. So is the book Life Lessons that you've learned throughout your whole kind of childhood, teenage years, adulthood, or is it, you know, based mainly on a certain part of your life? Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's from teenage years up until now. So maybe like the last 15, 17 years, more or less. Yeah. So yeah. it was really hard mm. to break it down, but I I broke it down to about nine, yeah. nine core, nine core essential okay. lessons that I, I, I really thought were important. Hmm. The idea of the episode is not to spoil the book. I want people to read the book uh, and to read it right. myself. So I, I don't want to dive into, you know, like the, the details of what's exactly in the book. Um, and we, we'll talk about it a little bit, but I like to talk about the genesis of the book. How did you, you know, you you were inspired by the movie. You thought about writing a book at some point in your life, but to actually make it happen is a whole other step, a whole other level. Um, right. A lot, I think a lot of people would like to write a book one day, but to actually write it is is is, is a whole other story. Yeah. Can you tell Definitely. us a little bit about the yeah the origin story of the book? When did you really say I'm actually going to do this? You know, and and why the Montana method and one not I don't know you know another book about something else? Why did you pick this topic for your right. first one? So writing for anyone that wants to write a book my advice is first off make sure you have a message that you really believe in don't mm. say you want to write a book and then that you know yeah whatever and then you just kind of like don't even believe in what you're doing you really have to with, with your heart and soul you have to believe in the words you're saying and you're writing that's that's before anything yeah. right uh, aside from that the I like to write by hand, so I'm very different from most writers. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And I I didn't edit anything out. I wrote everything by hand, and I just basically spell checked everything, and and it was we printed. So I, I'm a strange writer. Wow. I, I know what I want to say. I write <laughs> it down, and and it goes out. Um, so me personally, what I did was originally I just outlined the. The main, I, I really had to think because I, I, there's so much I want to say, right? So yeah. I broke it down into, all right, if I could only, like, if I died tomorrow and I had one person in front of me, what would I want to tell them about life? Right? Mm. I only have a day to, to teach them what I want to teach them. So mm. I, I wrote down, I just started with bullet points. So I was like, okay, this is important. This is important. This is important. This is important. And then from there, um, I would do sub bullet points. I'd go back to a bullet point. I'm like, all right, this is chapter one. So what am I going to talk about in this chapter? Okay. I'm going to talk about this, this, and it, it would literally be one word. So just start out, just, just jotting down ideas. You'd be surprised. You come up with some mm -hmm. pretty good stuff just from giving yourself. Uh, I, I like to write down a word and then I think about what's, what's, what makes that word. So for example, um, mm -hmm. the first chapter is, is about, well, I'll tell you the title of the first chapter. One is called Elian, Fidel and the Dream Stealers. So I was, that wasn't the name of the title and I wasn't even going to talk about any of that stuff in the first book, in the first chapter. But the first topic of discussion in, in the, in the book, I wanted to be, all right, so what's, what, how does everything start in life? Like what, what's the starting mm -hmm. point of anything? And I will, and I, I've read a lot of books and I've been to a bunch of seminars and they basically all the say, say the same thing, right? It's like desire. When you have a desire mm -hmm. in your heart and an idea in your mind, that's where something starts, right? So I was like, okay, mm -hmm. what, what entails having desire? Okay, so you're going to encounter resistance. You're going to encounter dream stealers. So I call them the dream stealers. Dream stealers are people who are going to come mm -hmm. and try to, you know, take that, that desire away from you, right? So when we're mm -hmm. kids, you basically think anything is possible. I want to be in, if I, if yeah. I asked five-year-old Jeremy what he wanted to be, he'd probably say, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? He'd probably say, oh, you know, he, uh, I want to be an astronaut or I want to be president of yeah. France or I want to, you know, 
be a millionaire. He, he'd say yeah, something we have big, big ambitions. right? Yeah. Mm. How many five year old kids say, I want to work a nine to five with health insurance yeah. benefits and get two weeks paid? No, nobody's, no, kids don't say that. Where it's a, so desire, be a CPA. I, I, no. yes, exactly. <laughs> now, I, I clarify in that chapter that there's nothing wrong with making an honest living. I'm not making, I'm not making fun of like people who, who chose that route. What I am saying is there's an, a subconscious and unconscious process that happened in your mind when you were little. There was an event that took place where someone told you, no, that's not possible. You're an idiot yeah. for thinking yeah. that you can do that. <clears throat> and because of that, your mental reaction was to, okay, I'm going to become realistic. Mm. That was a total subconscious process that happened in our minds that we were not aware of at all. Now, the cool thing is people can change and evolve over time. So now my whole goal, if I if I could put the goal of the book in one word, it'd be awareness. I want to make you aware mm -hmm. of the things you were not aware of before. All the things mm -hmm. that happened in your life and my life and everybody's life that I was lucky enough to realize what they were and make corrections. And at the same time, I realized that 99% of people have no clue of these processes that happen in their mind. Mm. They, they, uh, and in their in their life every day so i was like you know what my whole goal is just to make you aware that's it i'm gonna show you what's happening throughout different points of your life i'm gonna make you aware of it and now you don't have the excuse of oh you can't be a victim anymore yeah, yeah. because awareness is the first step to everything right it's like once you know mm. once you have that you're able to desire again and have the idea from there you can do anything really Yeah, from there you can make a choice to carry on this life, but yes. then you know. It's, that's the difference. Is that now yes. you know that exactly you're on this path 100%. and you choose it when or, or you can look yep. for another thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yep. It, it is really fascinating. I mean, this, just just this topic, like this is something we could talk about for a few hours to be honest, because for sure. Um yeah, the way society as a whole condition us because it's not just you know parents that uh, destroy the kids dreams it's not one individual person most of the time it's just mm. the education system the society the definitely the, the the whole yeah it's it's a whole system that is creating this uniformity and wants you to be on the normal path mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to be just part of the was group <laughs> What's crazy is in in the chapter, I actually touch up on the fact that the people who do who, the, the dream stealers in your life don't do it consciously. They do it because they think they're doing the right thing. Yeah. yeah. They do it because they don't want to see you fail. They don't want to see you get hurt. They don't want to see. So that's another topic I, I cover in chapter one. It's like these. So I call them the 99 percenters and the one percenters. So the one percenters, I got to say what the 99 percenters are first. So 99 percenters are people who are totally unaware in life. Mm. They're, they're people who have no clue what's really going on in the core of their being. Mm. And they just go day to day, you know, paycheck to paycheck. They work a nine to five and like life happens to them. Yeah. Right. They yeah. just think that, Oh, I can't control anything. And circumstances happen, happen to me. And I can't, con you know, all that, that conversation. One percenters are people who are aware mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with material possessions. It has nothing to do with accomplishments, even though, you know, material possessions, accomplishments, fitness, relationships all all the happiness all these things are side effects of being a one percenter meaning you are conscious of what's going on and you're you're practicing the the steps mm. necessary to, to get what you want out of life the the rewards are just a side effect yeah. with the the true the true value of being a one percenter is the journey it's the it's the day in day out of building that habit that makes you a one percenter mm. that really you know, makes that big shift in your life. It's not so much what you get from it. It's, it's more the, the entire process. So, yeah. So 99 percenters are first, the biggest, the biggest discrepancy is awareness and unawareness. The second biggest discrepancy is 99 percenters think failure is like death. Mm -hmm. Like they think there's no coming back from failure ever again. And you're going to die if you fail. Whereas a one percenter understands that, I mean, It's not the end of the world if I fail. It's actually, I need to fail in order, in order to learn, in order to get better, right? Yeah. So that's why these the dream stealers try to prohibit you from going out and pursuing anything because 
in their mind, failure is like, oh my God, it's the point of no return. It's, they literally feel like it's like this fight or flight thing where they feel like they're going to die if yeah. they fail. Mm. You know? So, yeah, it's um, desire is desire, um, ideas. I, I basically can break it the first chapter down to, you know, if, if, if someone else had an idea, someone else had a desire and it worked out for them, then your idea or desire can work out for you. There's no reason why it can't. When and how did you have this realization that when did you become aware to put it this way? <laughs> um, I had several moments, right? Because there's, yeah, you think, you know, but you have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> If I had to say one moment, I actually write about it in the book. The, um, there's a moment in my life where I'm about 18 years old mm -hmm. I had just moved out of my, my mom's house when I was 17. I moved out when I was pretty young. Not because we fought or anything, but because my mom was moving really far. And I didn't want to, it was, I had six months left of high school. So I was like, no, yeah. but I want to finish high school, you know? Yeah. So I moved out. Um, I was flat broke. <laughs> I had more months left at the end of the money. And I, w I had become really bitter. Really, really, really bitter. Mm -hmm. Really bitter. And I, I decided as a punishment, like, you know, as a screw you to God, I became an atheist, which makes no sense. But that, that was kind of my thing. Like, I decided, I was like, you know what? In order to show you who's boss, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to believe in you anymore. Mm -hmm. You know? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's basically, I was I was just really bitter. Mm -hmm. And I, ha I was done with people. People irritated me. I didn't like being around people. I, I basically did like the bare minimum contact with whoever I need to every day. And, and past that, I wasn't willing to engage with anybody. It, it's a, it was a really sad perspective looking back on it, you know, mm. and then it actually sloped into kind of like a, a deep depression, you know, of blame, just blaming and blaming and mm. blaming again, 99 percenters, right? <laughs> Circumstances are outside your control. So you keep blaming. It's like you give the power to whatever's, you know, yeah. consuming your life or whatever. Instead of taking responsibility for it and say, okay, what role am I playing in this? How can I improve this? You know? So it's, it, it just kind of, you know, snowballed. And then I, I, I got into a deep depression and I was just in a really dark place in my life. And one night I was, I had just, I was working at McDonald's, you know, great job, right? Mm -hmm. Super luxurious. <laughs> uh, I had get, got off a long shift. I go to play pool with some of my buddies and I'm the first one to show up. I just kind of like hang out and it's really dark out and the stars are out. It was a beautiful night and it got to the point in my life where I kind of understood, like I took it as a sign that my life was only getting worse because of this resentment I had, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I kind of just took them. I was bawling too. I was so, I was so sad that night. I was, I just couldn't take it anymore. I, I there was so much like, it wasn't physical pain, but it was so much mental and emotional pain that I felt. Yeah. And um, I, I just sat on my car and I looked up at the sky and I was bawling. And it was just tears pouring down my eyes. And I was like, all right, God, Buddha, Allah, whatever you call yourself, you know, all right, I get it. You know, you, like you're breaking my legs. I'm being stubborn. I'm sorry. Just I, I don't need a lot, man. Just try to try to give me a clue in the right direction, you know. Mm. And then I have no proof that this is true, but I choose to believe that, that the, the subsequent events happened in my favor because of that moment. Two weeks later, my best friend from high school uh, talked to me about a telecommunications business opportunity, and uh, I, I hopped on board. Mm. And that was my first business venture. Do you mind if I challenge you? So, sure. <laughs> you were saying before that, you know, when you're part of the 99ers, you rely on external factors. That you are right. in a dry, you are in a passenger seat in the car, right? Life is happening to you, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. with what you just described, what you're saying is thanks to an intervention of God or something like that, this opportunity came up. So you're putting this opportunity into the hand of an external factor again, rather than you you made I it happen. I choose to believe that, but. What I, what I, what really, I choose to believe that, right? But what really happened was, is that I, all the, all the emotional buildup and all the mental buildup I had went away. Mm. I felt clarity. Yeah. yeah. So I was able to see in front of me what was already there. 
Do you understand? Because even if so, that opportunity had come up like two weeks beforehand, you might have said no because you weren't in the right headspace for it, and you probably needed I wouldn't that have time even to picked like, up the phone. Yeah, yeah exactly. you needed the time to get rid of all like get out all the emotions, right? And then come back to you exactly. and then see it and be like, oh shit, that could be good. So yeah, correct, exactly. <clears throat> so really, what happened was I just all that all that went away, and then that just clarity, mm. mental clarity, emotional clarity, being neutral. And just being able to be aware. Yeah. That's really what happened. Yeah. No, yeah. Sure. So my, my point was that was that I'm not like judging the fact that you believe that it came from that, but I think you should give yourself more credit, you know, because it's not just for sure from that. It's you, you did the work, maybe unconsciously. Right. You, you don't know why, you don't know how, but you did the work and you decided that it was time to change things and to pick up the phone and Correct. listen to your friend and everything. So, yeah, my, my point with that was just to give you more uh, credit okay, for yeah. this for this change because I think it's not just something that right. happened to you. You made it happen to yourself in a way. Definitely, and more than anything, the it, if you if you if you recollect what I said, it was more like an apology. I wasn't even yeah. I, mm -hmm. I was I wasn't really asking for anything, but it was more like just letting myself, you know, come come to terms with my situation, acceptance, and then moving forward. You know, yeah, acceptance, mm -hmm. definitely. 100%. Yeah. So I'd love to ask you about, like, I always find it so, like, admirable and brave when somebody writes about their real life, and especially when bad things happen, mm. and write about this happened, this happened, this and happened, but then here's the lesson I learned from it, and it's wonderful, and it's it's great that you can share that knowledge with other people, but it also must be scary knowing that you're telling, like, your deepest, darkest secrets in a book that people can read. Did that scare you at all? Like, were you completely open and honest or were there certain things that maybe you held back? And I don't know if I could do it. That's why I'm asking. I'm just like, I think I'd be too scared of being sure. so honest. So I actually write about this in, in the book as well. I, I had, a, I, I, my, in my relationship with my father today, if, if you read some of the stuff I write about my dad in the book, you're going to think he's a terrible person, but he's not, he, he's a good person. Mm. He's, he just has his own, issues that he deals with just like everybody else yeah uh growing up he lied to me a lot mm. like an obscene amount and it wasn't just me he's just you know compulsive <laughs> liar mm. yeah yeah and um it was a blessing in disguise because i kind of learned what it was like to be lied to mm. and i decided you know what i don't i don't want anybody to feel this way because of me mm. like i'm gonna tell the truth as often as possible and if it's difficult to say it i'm at least not gonna lie yeah like you know so i've i've always had that idea in the back of my head mm. ever since i was pretty small and I, when i was writing this book i was like you know what the truth is a part of my being it's a part of my core like if i don't tell the truth what am i I'm, this book is is meaningless mm. it's not me mm. so whenever i wrote about something difficult or you know something i thought was kind of personal i was like look man the truth the truth is the truth. It's undeniable. Well, there's, there's actually a quote. I, I, go on, I'm sorry. No, go on. Carry on. There, there's a quote I write in the book uh, that says, um, I don't, I don't fear anyone. I never lie. You only lie when you're afraid. Mm. That's a quote from John Gotti, <laughs> former mob boss of the Gambino yeah, crime family. I know, I know my, my, my <laughs> idols are like interesting, but, uh, <laughs> But yeah, there's, I, I like to, I like to understand that life isn't so black and white that you can, you can learn good things from bad people Yeah, you know, yeah. and they have good qualities. You can definitely pick apart. Mm. So yeah, that, I remember that as well. Whenever I'm, I'm like scared of saying the truth, I'm like, what am I scared of? Yeah. You know, it's the truth. The truth is, is the truth, whether I'm scared of it or not. So why be, why be afraid? I was going to say hats off to you. Cause I think it takes a lot of courage. Like I said, to to kind of talk about hard moments in life, whether it is in a book or a podcast or a like a documentary, what like a movie, whatever it is, it sometimes is hard to tell your story it. and like be honest about it. But I think it's amazing that you have done because you're then sharing the lessons that. And it's I was going to say this as well because like I guess with like your particular book and your particular lessons, it's things that either people have gone through before and they relate, or maybe they haven't gone through them before right. and they learn something about somebody else's life. And so it's amazing when people share their kind of their insights and their lessons from life because you can teach people and people can relate to you as well. So I'm excited right. to read and, it. And per perspective <clears throat> is so important in life, right? Sometimes 
you you dealt with something and you and you learn something from it, and then someone else will deal with something similar and they learn something totally different. Yeah, like everyone's experience is entirely different. Like even if you have the exact same, mm. even the same family, like if you you know brothers and sisters might have the same upbringing but a completely different experience, mm. and it's the same thing and take away different lessons from it. And no, it's good. Well done. Right. <laughs> Thank you. I we got a friend in Miami who sometimes. And I've, I've heard a few people saying that actually, but um, even if it's scary to be vulnerable and to put yourself out there, uh, in a way, even if it's scary, don't be selfish. Don't stop there because by communicating your message, you're going to help others. And if you don't communicate mm -hmm. it, you're being selfish because you're not helping other. You're not giving the chance for other people to learn from whatever you're going to be communicating. Mm. And I think if you sit this 100%. way, if you sit this way, it kind of make it way less scary. And it's like, yeah, I might feel discomfort by saying X, Y, Z, but I'm okay to take this discomfort because I think people are going to get value from it. It's like a gift, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And like I think when you sit this way, it's a gift for people to learn lessons that you've That's gone it. through, like the hard way. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, the the book, it's basically, you know, I asked myself if I die tomorrow, what am I leaving behind? And that's the reason I wanted to write a book because I felt like it's a way of being immortal. Your yeah. message is always here, you know, and if you can help somebody even when you're not around anymore, mm -hmm. that's the biggest blessing, you know? Yeah. For sure. Maybe to go back and actually maybe to give some context to... Rosie and the few who <laughs> never watched Scarface. <laughs> Come on, there's got to be another one. It's not just me. Just a few. The couple of people there. I would recommend if you've never seen Scarface, watch the movie and then read my book. Okay. <laughs> it'll it'll give you perfect context. <laughs> um, no, but so but just to give like a tiny bit of context without spoiling the book. So Tony Montana is Cuban. He arrives in Miami. He was part of the criminals that were released from the island basically in the seventies, mm eighties. -hmm. I don't remember the date to be honest. Yeah, there was a there was a massive uh, immigration into Miami called the Mario and Mariel, the Mario Boatlift, <coughs> where basically uh, the, Cuba had gotten really bad, and, and Fidel's, you know, the the communists over there. The solution is always, oh, we're not keeping you here. Leave if you want to leave. Mm -hmm. So you know. Like I think it was like 125,000 Cubans left. They left uh, wow. Cuba to Miami, and what Fidel didn't tell the American government is he emptied his jails, he emptied his uh, like his mental hospitals. Mm. He basically anybody he didn't want in the country, he would shut. He would, he would be like, "All right, you want to leave? Your parents are here to pick you up. Your sister's here to pick you up in a boat. Okay, great, but you got to take these people too if you want to leave." Mm. So he, for every like couple citizens that were on a boat, he'd force two or three or four criminals to get on there with him. You know, it, it wasn't even criminals. It was basically he did anybody. He didn't like, he was a total yeah. bigot. So mm -hmm. if you were gay, he, he, he made you leave. If you were like, if you had a mental disorder, he made you leave. He was, Fidel was a bad person. He was a really racist, big bigot. He, he was a terrible guy, but anyway, yeah. So it was, it was predicted that out of the 125,000 pre predicted Cubans that made their way over, something like 20% of them had criminal records that were known of, mm. not including the people who, who didn't have any records and were criminals anyway. Yeah. So it, was, <laughs> yeah. it was pretty crazy. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, and basically in, in, in the movie, you follow Tony Montana who just arrived in Miami. He's, one got, of the criminals, he's, yep. he's got nothing. And, mm. and eventually he walks his way up to become the biggest drug uh, boss of everywhere mm. and, and he got a big mansion yeah. on Star Island. <laughs> oh. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where you the movie was. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, I thought it was yeah. quite like it's, a, it's love actually it. pretty cool when you know Miami as well, yeah. to, be honest, to be honest. Yeah, it's it's a fantastic movie. It's for Cubans. I mean, there's not a whole lot of people we can point to. And then yeah. not only that, Al Pacino plays a Cuban. I mean, yeah. it, it's <laughs> hats off to him, man. He even spoke Spanish like a Cuban. He was he did a fantastic job. It's amazing. <laughs> it's my life. That's like a bucket list. Like If I could meet Al Pacino <laughs> and tell him one thing, I'd be like, thank you for playing Tony Montana. Yeah. <laughs> you did so good. You and know? what's interesting about the movie is you follow the rays and the fall. Ah. Yeah, it's not just yeah. a success story. Yeah. It's, it's part of success, but yeah. also it's... Uh, yeah, the, the ups and the downs. Yeah. Um, right. But you know, it's, it's interesting because so 
yeah, I mean, it's an amazing movie. And I think, you know, even if Tony Montana is a criminal sell drug, everyone loves Tony Montana. I think <laughs> when you yeah. see this movie, it's like, <laughs> Pretty much. he's the dude, right? He's the boss. Like, you want to be like him. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, to to actually get life lessons from Na and apply them to your own life and maybe apply them to your own businesses that you had and stuff like that. Uh, how how did you come with to that? You know, how did that influence your businesses and stuff like that? Yeah, so as a kid, I just watched the movie so much that I learned everything by heart. Like, I could tell you the whole movie <laughs> forward and backwards. You know, I, I do, as you got, as... As Jeremy knows, I do a great Tony Montana impression. <laughs> We're going to have to um, hear it. Go on. You can't say that and not do it. <laughs> Am I going to... You want to pick like a whole scene? Well, pick one. Oh, Jeremy, pick know. a scene. Well, you, you can do the one at the beginning when, when he arrives in, in the US. Well, and when he's, he's, like, like, in, when he's yeah. like sitting back. Like, this, is the, this is classic, right? <laughs> State your name. Antonio Montana. But you can call me Tony. <laughs> like this is the iconic one, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, the opening scene is pretty cool. Anyway, um, so yeah, definitely watch the book before you read read the um. So anyway, as far as it was just the way he carried himself, he there was this magic about Tony Montana, you know. There it was this aura that he gave off. Mm -hmm. It was, it was, it was this innate energy that came from him. It was. It was everything about him. You, you didn't see, I, like, he's such a big character. He's so, he's so bigger than life that it's like you don't see the 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 you know the coke deals and the, all the mm -hmm. bad stuff he does. You just see him as a person. You're like, man, I want to be like that guy. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I want to be that guy who got here with holes in his shoes, with nothing in his pocket, starving, hadn't eaten in three days, was had been on a boat trip for a day and a half, comes here to live in a tent. And then leaves the tent to become worth nine figures. Like the guy goes on to make hundreds of millions of dollars. It's, it's just nuts. And I just picked apart, like I picked up the, the good things from him and I applied them in my life. And I didn't realize I was doing it, but because I had that reference of like every time I had a, there were times in my life where I was like, man, if Tony was in this situation, what would he do? Mm -hmm. And I really did it. It was really a matter of, it's it's his swagger, his demeanor. So it's like he doesn't take shit from anybody. He he gets his way no matter what. He finds way to make shit happen. It's there's so many things about him. He's very protective of his family. He's just there's so many traits, you know. So, mm -hmm. but I broke him down to about nine. Uh, the first one was like just finding finding a way to make it happen and regardless of what other people tell you mm -hmm. that's basically the really what the first chapter comes down to like this is what i want i don't give a shit what you tell me you know i'm, I'm this is this is it you know what i mean so and then the second lesson was basically his 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 like journey the journey itself of what how he he rose and fell was was the lesson like basically like there's going to be steps to get to where you want to get to. And then once you're there, there's certain things you have to do to stay there. Because yes. if not, you're not going to stay there. Mm -hmm. Because just like you were hungry and you were, you were, you were willing to do whatever, you, whatever it took to accomplish your dream. Now, when you're here, there's a hundred thousand people down here who have all that hunger that you used to have. So if you don't work to maintain what you have, you're going to lose it. Mm -hmm. And the next guy who had all that hunger and all that drive that you lost as soon as you got there is going to take it. That's exactly, mm -hmm. that's, that's like a classic, classic. And that's a, another chapter in the book. Um, there's just so many, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, so that's, that's very true. You know, um, we work very hard to create something. And then when we did it, it's like, okay, I made it. I can chill now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, actually, Definitely. yeah, yeah. But no, because <laughs> if you want to stay there, if you should just give everything up, what's the point, you know? And I mean, yeah, exactly. it's about the journey. It's not just about the destination, but, you know, if you want to enjoy the ride and enjoy being on top of the 100%. wave, bit, ride the wave, you, mm. you, you need to put the effort Definitely, Definitely 100%. Yeah. I know you don't want to give away the book, but I'm just going to name off 
the the titles of the chapters oh, yeah, so you it. guys Fine. get an idea of, <laughs> do of... It. <laughs> so uh here we go let me see all right so chapter one I kind of already talked about. I called it El Yang, Fidel, and the Dream Stealer. So that's where we talk about people who are going to try it. Like whenever you want to desire something, whenever you have an idea that's like out of the normal, someone's going to come and try to mm -hmm. take that away from you. The next chapter is called the Pathfinder's Pyramid. So that, that I'll show you the quick little synopsis. That basically is um, everybody's journey in life who's going to go after anything. So I don't know if you can kind of see it there. But yeah. Oh, yeah. It starts off, the, the bottom one says survival, distraction, okay. searching, and purpose. Mm. So basically, everybody in life starts out in this survival mode. You know, where's my next meal coming from? How am I going to pay the light? Uh, you know, just that very scarce, they, they live in scarcity. Yeah. Now, in this stage of life, you learn important things. You learn how to hustle. You learn uh, patience. You learn endurance. You get you, you gain a certain a certain mental toughness mm -hmm. from from going through the, all these obstacles, right? And at the same time, you're not meant to survive your entire life. So it's like, okay, if you're lucky enough to have something spark that that desire in you, right? Because it doesn't happen for everybody. Mm -hmm. If you're lucky to to want to proceed in life and ask the question, "What's out there for me?" Mm -hmm. or at least say, "Okay, there's something more than this to life." Then you're going to evolve into the next level, which is distracted. Here, you're living very comfortable. You've grown out of survival. You find a way to, to live like a comfortable lifestyle. Mm. Here, you're going to every concert, you're going to every nightclub. You're going to all the music festivals. You've traveled to a bunch of countries. Uh, you're eating at really good restaurants. You're doing all the stuff you could not do when you were surviving, mm. right? <laughs> and you're having a lot of fun. <laughs> so, basically... That is, is very seductive, right? Because since you're coming from survival and now you're living in this, you know, nice, comfortable life, it's it's like people get stuck there forever. Mm -hmm. And Miami is a typical, Miami <laughs> is like the distraction city, the distraction city. Everybody's always doing some fun stuff and people do that their entire lives down here. It's nuts. Mm -hmm. and, and again, if you don't ask what's out there for me, what what else is there? You know, you'll get stuck in that process forever, you know? Mm -hmm. So the next one, is mainly who I wrote the book for. This is, this book was designed to either get you to this mm -hmm. level or talk to you if you're already in this level. So level three is called searching. Searching is when you're done with the distractions, you're done with the BS, you're done surviving, you're done with all that stuff. You're really serious about, all right, what's out there for me? Mm -hmm. What what? How can I leave an impact on this planet? What is my life's purpose? What am I passionate about? What do I, what do I want to do with my life? And at that point, it's a good, also a good space to be in because you're, you're, you're like conscious. Now you're living the co a conscious life. You're not doing things for the sake of doing them. Yeah. And it's good because you learn a lot of good skills there. I mean, when you're searching, you learn how to network, you learn how to be decisive. You learn how to be like very direct. You're, you don't have time to waste. You realize that life is finite, right? Mm. Downside is some people search forever because they don't make up their freaking mind. <laughs> right? So um, what I tell people is you're more you're more likely to find out what your passion is in life by going in the wrong direct in the wrong in the wrong direction than not, by not moving at all. Because if you go in the wrong direction, you're gonna you're gonna know you're going in the wrong direction, you're yeah. gonna you're gonna force correct. <clears throat> Versus if you don't move at all, you know you can't expect you're change. You're not getting anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. And then the last level four is purpose. Purpose is everything. It's it's what people dream of. Purpose is when you find what you really want to do with your life. And everything seems like it's almost surreal because it's it's something you've always dreamed of. And then you have it. And at the same time, you, you're constantly like, you're, you're constantly striving to stay there, right? goes back to what we said. If you don't do what it took to get there, mm. you're going to lose what you have. So it takes a level of ma maintenance. Uh, the good thing is once you get there, you're, you've built a lot of skills. You've developed a lot of character. So you have what it takes to maintain it. And it's actually easier because th you've gotten very skilled versus who you were down here where you had no skills. Yeah. And now you have these resources to use, you know, mm. to do what, what you want. Mm. So that's chapter two. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I think 
when you get to this stage, more than the skills, and I mean, they are important. I don't want to diminish them, but more than the skill is that I think is you know that even if things go not the way you expected, you'll find a way to, 100%. you know, um, because you're not scared of failure, like we said at the beginning, mm. because you know that the world is full of opportunities. And even if things go unplanned, I think you'll be, you, you know it'll be all right deep inside you because you know that there are ways right. around things. 100%, definitely. That That's actually, that's one of the skills, tenacity. Yeah. Mm. yeah. <laughs> right. Mm. So, I mean, it, when you talk about skills, you, you can go on and on. There's so many you can develop, but, you know, it's just uh, skills and character are definitely the two main things, I would say, mm. that you develop once you're there. Or you have been developing up until that point. Mm. Yeah. At what stage are you right now? You're on the third one or the fourth one? Are you searching or you you find your purpose? I I want to say I'm I'm living my purpose. I still have some work to do, so I'm. I, I'm not searching. I, I've, I'm pretty confident I've, I've found my purpose. I've I've been writing. I, I liked writing ever since I was a little kid. So I just stopped for you know for God knows what reason. And I, the day I picked the pen back up, it was like I never stopped. Mm. So writing seems to be my purpose for sure. And what was the like you said, the the second level is very tempting because it's fun, uh, especially in Miami. You 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 know you. Some people I think would be happy to stay stuck there <laughs> because it's a fun, <laughs> it's a fun level, you know? <laughs> No, I think that I think people confuse distraction for purpose. <laughs> yeah, they're yeah. like, this is what I wanted. All all I wanted to do was stop surviving. You know. Yeah. So it's like. They think uh, they think that's where they're supposed to be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So what? Th that was my point. What took you from this point to searching? What What was the the thing like? Oh, actually, this is fun. Yeah, but I want more than that. Ever since I left survival, I knew I had a purpose. Mm. So you, you, there's no skipping. You go through all four. Mm. There's there's no mm. way around it. However. In addition to having to go through each level, like I said, in order to advance, you're always asking, you have to ask yourself the question, what's out there for me? What's really, what's, what's the meaning of life, you know? So when I went from survival to now distraction, why, why did I say that it's some people's goal to be in, to, they think distraction is purpose? Because I went through that. So when I went when I went from surviving to distracted, I, I had a better lifestyle that I didn't have before, mm. and I thought that this was what life was about. And then once I realized that it's those are just experiences are great, but like it wasn't my life's goal to you know to say, oh, you know, <laughs> I went to the Bad Bunny concert last week. Yeah. <laughs> you mm. know what I mean? Like what I realized was experiences are great. But behind, behind your feelings, there's nothing. But behind every principle, there's a promise. So mm. I, what I basically realized was my emotions are going to play tricks on me. So even when I think I'm where I want to be at, I really just have to go back to my core principles. You know, does this align with what, I, what I'm looking for? Does this align with who I am as a person? Does this align with my my what I call ultimate you, mm -hmm. you know, end game you? Ultimate you is, is the best version of you. It's, you know, if time and money were, were of no problem, mm. like if you had all the money you could ever want and all the time you could ever have, you know, what would you be doing? Where, we, where, what clothes would you wear? What car would you, would you drive? What, what house would you live in? Um, who would you hang around? What food would you eat? All that stuff. What, what would you do with your time and material possessions aside, you have to be that person now, because if you're not that person now, you're never going to get to that. Mm purpose-driven life because mm. most people get it twisted they think oh I'll, I'll start acting that way once i have this it's like no 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 you need to start acting that way to get that mm. yeah so that's all in chat sorry we ask questions. No, that's so that's all in chapter two mostly yeah so then what's <laughs> chapter three i want to hear all the titles sure <clears throat> so chapter three is called strategy okay um so you have you have your your desire you have your idea 
Mm-hmm. Um, you know that there's, you identify what level of life you're in, right? And now it's time to actually put, put a plan into action. Yeah. Now it's like, all right, I, I have an idea of what I want. I know where I'm at in life. Now, how do I get from point A to point Z? Mm-hmm. Right. And what I propose is what I just said. You have to, you reverse engineer your path because mm-hmm. if you want, if you, if you were capable of having what you wanted, you'd have it already. Yeah. You're not capable of having it right now. So you have to think from the mentality of, of ultimate you. This person is already at the mountaintop. Mm-hmm. It's impossible. When you, when you look up a mountain, it's impossible to climb up the mountain. It looks, it looks like you'll never be able to do it. However, climbing down a mountain is very easy mm-hmm. for the most part. So you reverse engineer the path. You start from the top and you come back from to the bottom. And then once you have that mapped out is when you can start moving forward. So I, I compare the perfect comparison to strategy that I make is, is a sailboat or, or a ship. Mm. A ship's purpose is to get from, is to move you. It's not even to get from point A to point B. It's really just for transportation. Mm. The ship itself isn't going to tell you where to go. It's not going to tell you how to get there. And it's not going to yeah. give you the resources necessary to make the trip. That's your responsibility. Mm. So unless you have a target, unless you have a set plan for where you want to go, the ship is going to do nothing more than waste your time and money. <laughs> right? So I, uh, I, a mentor of mine told me a long time ago that you're never nervous. You're just unprepared. Mm. True. So, that made that made perfect sense to me. Ever since mm-hmm. I heard that, whenever I was going to do something that made me nervous, I would just make sure I prepared in advance. And as soon as I was going to do it, I was ready to go. I was never nervous. It's it solved my anxiety issue like that. Makes a lot of so, sense. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. So yeah, the best navigators have contingencies in plan. They have more than the supplies they need. They know everybody's role on the ship. They know how long, more or less, it's going to get there. They know what kind of weather, all these things, right? Mm -hmm. So that's your responsibility when it comes down to strategy. Yeah. So, you know, what do I want to do with my life? Oh, I want to be a fitness trainer. Okay. What, what does it take? First off, I need to be in shape because if I'm not in shape, no one's going to listen to me. Yeah. (laughs) Right. What part of, what part of the the world do I want to construct this business in? Uh, What diet do I want to specialize in? What market am I talking to? Is it men or women? Does it, is it, is it unisex, whatever, just get very specific with your, with your vision and get very specific with how you're going to accomplish it. Yeah. Mm. yeah. What is the quote? Is it, uh, if you fail to plan your plan fail to, to fail or something yeah. like plan that? Plan to fail. Uh, yeah. You got yeah. it. 100%. <laughs> yeah. You got it. Definitely. Mm. And then chapter four is, uh, where is it? <sighs> chapter four. Chapter four is evolution. Which is an interest that goes back to what we were talking about. So evolution is you who you evolve to. You have to evolve as a person, mm-hmm. and that got your evolution has to say t- is twofold. It's your skills, your evolution of your skills as a person, and the evolution of your character as a person. So these these two things have an interesting symbiosis because the the better you get at one, the less you have to do of the other. The more the better a person you are, meaning the like the more integrity I have, the more honest I am, uh, the more the more g- good I do mm. as a person, the less I'm gonna have to work. I'm not gonna. Say, I'm not. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you don't have to work. You have to work very hard to get what you want in life. But be, having character is gonna attract more people. Yeah. You're gonna build better relationships. You're gonna have trust. You're gonna have quality of life. And then it's people are going to be excited to work with you. They're, you're going to attract them. It's, it's going to be fun to be around you. Yeah. you know? yeah. Whereas the opposite is also true. I mean, you can, you can be a really bad person, but you're going to have to work like 10, 20, 30, 40 times harder than the other person because you, you're, you, all your relationships are going to be destroyed. No one's going to stand you. You can't be around anybody because just you're like repulsive. It's, and then also, when I talk about bad person, it's not like a terrible person. It could it could range from character flaws all the way up to malicious tendencies. We're talking about different things, but a blind spot can affect you mm. in the same way as a malicious tendency. It's about becoming aware of your blind spots and, and making them better, you know? Yeah, it can be totally unconscious. I think just, you know, being, like, like we said at the beginning, being a victim and a negative person, mm. uh, even if right. you don't see yourself this way, can impact the people around you because you 
Right. Yeah. You, I don't know. I don't want to be around negative people that keep telling me right. that, you know, the world is a shitty place all day, every day. And uh, I, right. I don't want to hear that personally. You know, it's tiring. 100%. And, yeah, it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's just your way of seeing life and your way of judging everything is just exhausting me. <laughs> uh, yes. And, <laughs> and exactly. it's impacting my energy. Right. So, yeah, it's not about being a bad person like a bad person like we think it is. It can just be some traits mm. in your personality that makes you uh, not fun to be around. It can be as simple as that. Definitely. 100%. Mm. And then skills. For skills, I, I break it down into... Um, Skills are interesting because they're they're 100 learnable and teachable. Like you you can teach them to anyone and you can learn them from anyone. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, you know, divorce, bad economy, bankruptcy, none of that stuff will take away your skills mm -hmm. ever. Yeah. So the one thing you have as a person and you'll always be able to go back to is your skills, which is why I, I my tolerance for risk is like abnormal. <laughs> it's like it's it's very strange but the reason i'm so tolerant to risk is because i i'm confident in my skills and i know i know what i can do yeah you bounce back. skill set is everything definitely yeah 100 percent. that makes sense yeah. yep so and then chapter five uh i call it your prime the golden era of you so that's basically we talked about it a little bit it's like when once you reach the pinnacle of where you want to be mm -hmm. what the steps you need to take to maintain that um, which is, is, is pretty cool. What I talk about there. The next one is chapter six is called Mount Olympus and the phases of impossible. Mm. So Mount Olympus is basically that's, you know, in Greek philosophy, it's the mountain yeah. where all the Greek gods lived and they, it was very separate from everyone. And no one obviously was ever, ever able to climb the mountain because it was so far. That's what I call, uh, your purpose. Like mm. once you're living in purpose and you have if you have accomplished what you want, that's Mount Olympus to the outside world. Mm -hmm. That's unattainable. Yeah, it's not that you worked hard. It's not that you spent obscene amount of hours and days and weeks mm. and months studying people that have what you want and implementing what they what they taught you. It's not that you worked until exhaustion. It's not any of that stuff. It's that you're lucky. Mm. It's the overnight success. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The overnight success that took half my life. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. So <laughs> it's. That's why I call it Mount Olympus because to 99 percenters, that's what it is. It's Mount, Mount Olympus. And then I, I go into what's called the phases of impossible. So the phases, the phases of impossible, you know, basically I, I make it clear in the book that impossible is nothing more than a word that 99 percenters throw around whenever they see something that they don't want to do. Mm. Yeah. It doesn't even have to be difficult. They just, they just don't want to do it. Yeah. And they want to discourage other people from doing it. Running a mile in four minutes. Oh my God, that's impossible. Like 100,000 people have done that. What are you yeah. talking about? <laughs> Which is actually the example I use in the book. I talk about Roger Bannister. Roger Bannister was the first person to run a mile in under four minutes. And he did it back in the 50s. Mm. And before him, you know, nobody had ever done it. But once he did it, so many other people did it. Yeah. yeah. Because they had an example of, all right, Roger did it so I can do it. Yeah. And that's what's going to happen in your life. That's why it's your responsibility. Once you build that consciousness and that awareness of what you want in life, and you're aware of all these unconscious processes that were happening. It's your responsibility now. It's not, it's not like do I or do not. I think it's your responsibility to carry out your purpose because the people around you, your family members, your friends are going to use you as an example. You might be that conscious switch that they need to be like, all right, if Jeremy did it, I can do it. Yeah. Nice. So I could not agree more than with anything you said in this <laughs> one. Like this is the one that really Definitely. speaks to me. It's like this podcast exists because. In Miami, I met two guys who had a podcast. And it's like, if they can do it, I can do it. Suddenly, That's it, so awesome. It, it, <laughs> the podcast was like impossible. And it was like, okay, I mean, okay, if they can do it, it's probably not that hard, actually. I can figure it out. 100%. How do I start Definitely. a podcast? And here you are like, so true. Like, we have so many barriers in our life, in, in our brain, so many walls that we don't want to open. And then if you... <laughs> Human nature. If you meet the right people, and if you surround yourself with the right people suddenly all those inaccessible things become just opportunities. Mm. It's like, whoa, life-changing. When you 100%. see that, it's... <laughs> hey. 100%. Well, you suddenly realize yep. what's possible, so, don't you? Mm. And you can like have someone as inspiration, like, wow, yeah. they've done it, I can do it too. So, 100%. Yeah. And it's a responsibility. I, I really believe it. Yeah. Mm. I really do. Mm. The next chapter is about who do you listen to? 
which mm-hmm. is pretty good. It's about mentor, picking a mentor mm-hmm. uh, who to not listen to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a very good chapter. Uh, chapter eight is legacy and your superpower. So I talk about what do you want to leave behind? Who do you, who do you want to be remembered as? And I also talk about your superpower, meaning what, like everybody has an innate gift yeah. that they're born with and they're really good at. In my, in my example, uh, I tell, I write down in the book that I have two. One is I have a, a gift. My, my innate gift is to be very direct. Mm. I'm very direct. It's human nature to beat around the bush and like, oh, I don't want to hurt people's feelings. Yeah, that's I me. wasn't born with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't born with with that that in mind. I just I say what's on my mind, and and I actually think of it from the other way around. Instead of thinking, oh, I don't want to say this because it's going to hurt their feelings, I'm like, no, I should tell them the truth because it's going to help them to know the truth. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then my second superpower is uh, my tolerance for risk. I have an obscene risk tolerance. It's mm-hmm. not normal. <laughs> it's not normal at all where do you think that um, came from do you but, think you were born with it or do you think that's something that nurtured as a child or something? it was a muscle yeah wow. it was a muscle i built it over time yeah I, that, I definitely wasn't born with that i was i was pretty scared as, as when i was mm. much younger mm. um it's i i the more risk i took and the more i failed the more i realized that re- i'm not risking that much what yeah. what's a big mm. risk to somebody like you know a big what's a big, a big risk to like a normal person nowadays oh Oh man, I lose really all my money. Business, but I don't want to quit. Mm. Huh? To lose all my money. That's the main one. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh my God, if if I try to start this business and it doesn't work out, well then go get another job. Mm. Like the <laughs> job is always going to be there, you know? Yeah. yeah. Especially because like you said, you've got skills uh, that are never going to go. So if you leave your nine to five, risk it and try something new, you still got your skills to go and get another nine to five job somewhere else. Like it's like you said, your skills don't go 100%. anywhere. Hundred mm. percent, you got it. So, yeah. And in the case of Tony, I mean, man, <laughs> he had a few, but yeah. I think his number one. If I had to pick one, he was just fearless, man. Yeah. There was you could not scare that guy. That guy was, you know, I'm not gonna ruin it for for Rosie. I want to talk <laughs> about a scene in the movie, but <laughs> go ahead. I'm gonna watch it tonight. I think anyway. Yeah, so go it. ahead and go on talk about it. I don't mind. Well, there's a scene in a hotel where he's in a pretty tricky situation. You, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're not scared in that situation, you're not scared in any situation. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. I have to watch this film now. Definitely. I feel like I'm missing out. You do. I've never wanted to watch oh, it do, before. For sure. You do. I've never wanted to watch it before. I've always been like, oh no, it doesn't matter. First time, I'm like, oh my God. I don't no, know what's going on in the hotel. Fantastic. And, yeah. Very good. <laughs> and then the last chapter is, uh, I call it every dog has his day, which funny enough is, is a quote from the movie. Mm. Um, even though I, People, so there's different people have taken that quote different in different directions. Some people think every dog has his day. He was saying that to someone in the movie he was about to kill. So he's saying like, all right, you know, every dog has his day. It's time for this dog to die. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but I actually use the quote differently. I use it as every dog has his day, meaning like every everyone has their, their moment to shine. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So whenever I'm I'm like, having a terrible day or like I just worked out this morning and my chair and I was, di- I was dying. This morning. <laughs> <laughs> and I whispered to myself, I was like, all right, every dog has his day. Come on. <laughs> yeah. This is, let's go. You know? Yeah. This is, and then it's, I, I make the conscious shift in that moment to be like, all right, this is, this is my moment. You know, let's go. Yeah. So that's the book in, in a nutshell. And I mean, obviously it's, there's a lot more, but yeah. Yeah, the, I, it was really hard to break it down to nine core core lessons mm-hmm. because there was so much that you know that I wanted to talk about. But so, I'm a writer now. So are these so. lessons from the film that you also relate to your life? Is it kind of both are interconnected? So it's things from the film that also mm-hmm. you've learned through your life, and yeah, mm-hmm. good. 100%, yeah, it's things that I didn't realize <laughs> at the time that that I learned from the film yeah. that later on, once I actually used them in my life, is like, wow, Tony did that in the movie, or oh wow, okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So That's so cool. I don't think I've I went known. back and reversed it. I don't think I know of any of the book that like references a film so much in their life and how each mm. are interconnected. Like I mean I don't read a lot of books anyway, but <laughs> Jeremy does. Have you yeah, do you know any no, books that do no, that? Yeah, no, I don't I don't recall anything. It's like a new so idea that. that I've not heard mm. of before, I don't think. It's cool. Yeah, it was um it was it was it was special for me because I I've it's 
to get so much inspiration from a, a fictional character, it's it's. I mean, it's there's probably somebody who's done that out there, but mm. it's it was it was definitely a unique idea. At least yeah. I thought so. Yeah. So, oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> if people want to buy the book, where can they find it? Uh, if you live out of the Miami area, uh, go ahead and go to Amazon. I think uh, the Amazon link will be pinned yeah. to this yeah. podcast. Uh, go ahead and get it on there. Um, reach out to me. If you're in the Miami area, reach out to me. DM me on Instagram. Uh, I'm having a book launching event in the next few weeks, so come get it in person. I'll autograph it for you. We'll talk for a while. And um, yeah, my maybe I'll do this then. Here's my Instagram handle. Yeah, I'll, li- I'll, I'll, I'll link, I'll link it in the description directly. anyway. There it'll you be, go. It'll be yeah. there. <laughs> do you know what I love yeah. is when you were talking about, um, I think it was chapter like seven or eight, you were like, yeah, that's a good one. Like, I love that you have confidence in what you're saying just to be like, that's a good chapter. Like, I love that. I love that confidence. I love that you know that what you've written is good and you're not just like writing a book for the sake of it just to say you've written a book. Like, you're like, no, that's that's a good chapter. It's worth reading. I just had to throw that out there. I love that you have that confidence in yourself and that you know it's good content. Like, that's also inspiring for someone like me who's like always doubting myself <laughs> i love people that are like no that was good i did good work there so congrats watch, on that as watch well. the film <laughs> for someone like you you're gonna see the crazy insane situations <laughs> that tony puts himself in you're gonna be like how is he gonna get out of this and yeah. he finds a way to get not only does he get out of it he gets out of it with what he wanted yeah like it's it's wild i i that's another he's he's such a confident like character it's it's nuts he oozes confidence you know yes yeah. there's nothing you could do to hold him down mm. and i i i take that lesson as well for sure yeah that's no, yeah, good man. it's good to be proud of the work that you do and you know obviously it took a lot of hard work especially because you did it in six months which is crazy like writing a book from start yeah. to finish in six months and have it published and have a yeah. hundred copies at home and i took and i took six weeks off to, from writing oh, my goodness. <laughs> so i would have done it sooner um but yeah i it's pretty cool now when I have conversations with people and they're like, oh, you know, what What are you working on? What do you do for a living? And I'm a writer. Yes. And it's like, oh, wait. Yeah. No, I, I'm an author for real. <laughs> I love that as well when you can like yeah. claim it as like, I am an author. Yeah. Like, I, this is what I do. Like, it's not just like, oh, I sometimes write things and like, no, I'm an author. Love that. No, no. More confident. Yeah. I love yeah. people with confidence. No one can take that from you. Yeah. That's awesome. Definitely. Mm-hmm. I, if for anybody who's out there who's struggling with with confidence or they're not, um, if they're not like sure about like maybe you found your purpose or you want to take a chance at something, my 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 advice is just go for it, man. Yeah. Just take the risk. Life is life is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't worry about what you need to learn or what you're not prepared for. You, there, you'll learn along the way. Yeah. The best the the best way to learn anything is through is through doing it. Yeah. For sure. Making mistakes. So. Go out, you. take the risk, man. I'm not. I'm not telling you to like. Don't go put, <laughs> you know, five thousand dollars on on black three at, at the roulette table. That's all yeah, I'm no. saying. A calculated risk. Like if, yeah. if there's something you want to go for in life, and and you just like, man, I don't know if I should do it. Do it. Do it. You're not gonna regret it. Even if you fail, there's gonna be an important lesson that you take away from it, and you can always try again. Like just go for it yeah like life you only live once it's it's such a cliche but it's so true because we live in these in these cities where we have all these resources and we don't realize how finite life is because we're so safe and we have all these things given to us you know the supermarkets in the corner i don't have to hunt for my food i have running electricity Mm -hmm. i have a shower like there's so much in life that we can miss out on just from being safe comfort risk safety it's okay you're not gonna die just go out and experience life but whatever in your heart you've always wanted to try, do it. It's worth it. Definitely. The other thing 100%. you should do is go and buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. Buy the book. It'll definitely help you um, with all kinds of stuff, all kinds of different lessons. And if you feel you have a question a question after reading the book or anything, you reach out to me. Mm-hmm. Give me a DM. We'll talk about it. And again, if you're in the Miami area or if you're planning on traveling to Miami in, if, in April, Come by the event. You'll have a blast. You'll meet a lot of different people. A lot of good friends of mine that are pretty successful guys. Uh, they've already said they're going to come through. I can't make any official announcements yet, but <laughs> um, it's going to be good. So come by, have fun, and uh, come meet me in person. That's amazing. Really, congratulations. Uh, I've got to say that it's really cool to see. I-, I still remember the first day I met you at this 
training that we did <laughs> and and you know it's really cool to listen to you now and yeah. and see in two and a half years I mean, Anna, uh the the evolution it's really cool <laughs> i appreciate it jeremy thank yeah, you no, it's really cool i will link your instagram i will link the amazon page of the book so people can just click and purchase it and uh yeah we hope you find value in this episode buy the book yeah. Go and say hello to Nelson on Instagram. Send him a message. Say hi. Tell him you listened. Tell him if you read the book and how you feel about it, all the lessons that you learned. Thank you so much for listening and watching on YouTube if you watched us on there. Um, make sure you follow us. Make sure you leave a comment. Subscribe. Do all the things. <laughs> press all the buttons. And we'll be back next Wednesday with a brand new episode. Thank you so much, Nelson. Thank you. Bye. Take care, guys. <laughs>